everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation with a caregiver. I'm Brandi Gillett, a community librarian at Halton Hills Public Library and your host for today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that for those of you joining us from Halton Hills, the land on which we gather today is part of treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I also want to thank the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library for their support of the Halton Hills Lecture Series and the Alzheimer's Society of Hamilton Halton for moderating today's discussion. According to research, over half a million Canadians live with dementia and family members often jump into the role of caregiver with little warning or knowledge of the disease. Judy Schoen, today's speaker, fell into this category. Her experiences have led her to believe that no caregiver should walk their path afraid or alone. Judy's latest book, Did You Hide the Cookies, shares her candid reflections and personal experiences of being the sole caregiver to a loved one. She joins us today to discuss her journey as a caregiver and the emotional chaos that accompanies caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease, COPD, and anxiety. And now, without further ado, here is Judy Schoen in conversation with Danielle Arbor, the Public Education Coordinator at the Alzheimer's Society of Hamilton and Halton. All right, Judy, how are you? Hi, Danielle, and hi to those in the library uh, who are so wonderfully helping caregivers get information. I want to thank um, Danielle Arbor for having the Alzheimer uh society support for this um during the month of january which is alzheimer's awareness month yes. it's kind of exciting to be a caregiver in that uh context and um the library who is supporting alzheimer's and supporting caregivers and getting the word out about um where they can get information i think it's wonderful that you took this opportunity to uh give this information out. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're so excited to have you um, and have this conversation for caregivers. And again, to celebrate Alzheimer's Awareness Month, which is January. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Judy for the last probably six years now, um, but you have really been a really inspirational caregiver for many. So this conversation is for any form of caregiver, supporting persons with dementia, but just having somebody like Judy understand um, a little bit about your journey and potentially you can all learn a little bit more from her. So since we have you here, Judy, I would love if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you've done a little bit in life before. Well, you'll probably notice from my accent that I'm told I have, I'm American. Um, I was raised in the United States. I went to high school in Boulder, Colorado and went to Colorado State University. Um, I've been an art teacher for seven years at least. And I then went into the corporate world of marketing and advertising um, and in exhibit sales, I actually started, did a little transfer into exhibit sales. And that's when I came to Canada 37 years ago. And um, I was an immigrant for a long time, but 15 years ago, I became a Canadian citizen, of which I'm very proud. And um, my caregiving experience has been in Canada, which I think is important because it's different around the world. Um, Definitely. I'm sure. And so, when I speak, I speak from a Canadian reference point. Definitely. But it's, 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 uh, it's something to do all that and to become a, I was a website designer for 12 years and then become a caregiver and an author, which are totally unrelated to anything else I've ever done. So we just keep going. Yeah, definitely. And you support your partner, which you refer to in your books as your love. And how many years ago did you two meet? Oh, well, we met 30 years ago, but we've been together 27 years. Um, obviously, long we're, time. Not, we're not the first partners, but we've been together a long time. And amazing. Uh, it's been an amazing journey, and, but we never expect this mm -hmm. um, or to become a caregiver. Or I never expected to become a caregiver. So. Well, how, how, um, when was your, your love and your partner first diagnosed? 
Well, he actually, his doctor actually suspected something in 2012. And then, which is what, eight years ago? Nine then, now. Nine years ago, holy cow. And then um, it, it took a year for them to do, he had, he had his cognitive test and then they had some lab tests and scans and brain scans. And then they had um, memory clinics. He went to two or three of those. And at the end of all of that, the following year, they actually concluded that he had Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, which I learned yesterday from Danielle, our educator, that it is mixed dementia. So it has quite a few names, but recognized. And it's nice to know that they did that research to find out what he actually had. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's really a journey to get a diagnosis of dementia. It's not always just this one appointment is the be all end all like many think. Yeah, that's right. And it's not scary. It's just um, informative because it could be, it could be memory loss of a different kind. It could be mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, but there's many other kinds of dementia that I'm not yeah. even familiar with except by name. And it, you, you, I say must go to the doctor because Otherwise, you don't know. Yeah, it's really important. And don't be afraid. That's the thing I say is don't be afraid because there are help. There are people that help. There, there are things to do. There are directions mm -hmm. to help you with. Definitely. So you've used a, the word caregiver already in our conversation, and and some families resonate with the word care partner, um, just family member. So the word caregiver. What does that mean to you? And when did you first connect with that word, caregiver? Well, I had no idea what Alzheimer's was or what caregiving was when all this began. And when I did my research initially about Alzheimer's online, the word caregiver or something similar, as you say, was um, somewhere associated with it. And so eventually I started looking at what that was and I went, holy cow. Um, can I do this? And um, I had no choice, really. And so that was when I first, it was the Alzheimer's connection to caregiving that made me even understand that there was such a concept. And um, it, it, it was scary at first, believe me. I was petrified. I felt desperate. All those emotions where you're just, you know, can I do it? But through, um, learning and education and talking to other people and other caregivers who are ahead of me, if I can use that uh, mm -hmm. term. Um, that was wonderful to have their experience help me. And um, so I, I knew the value of sharing. Definitely. And uh, as you said, you are an author, as mentioned in the intro that you have two books. I have the second one here. What was your inspiration to start writing some of your stories down? The doctors. Um, I'd go to the doctor's visit with, with my love, and I definitely was not prepared for the fact that they would ask uh, so many questions of me that I had to remember. And all of a sudden, I realized he's the one that doesn't remember. I have to. And so I had to write it down because I couldn't. And sometimes it'd be six months, a year between appointments. And uh, so I started journaling. And then I didn't just journal bullet points anymore. I started telling the story in an email. And then somebody suggested, oh, that's a fun story. You ought to write a book. Uh, and I just write stories, you know. And, uh, and eventually I actually did write the stories. And then they became chapters. And then they became stories. And the story still goes on. And now you're an author of two books. The first book I understand is more the beginnings of your journey as a caregiver. And the second book, once again, uh, Did You Hide the Cookies, which I have read, as you can see from all my little post-its, um, is a little bit more deeper. And you actually start the book off in, from what I hear from caregivers, one of their biggest fears which is the moment that your partner didn't recognize who you were. Could you talk about that moment and how you felt? That was a, um, a very unexpected moment at the time. It still is now. 
Mm -hmm. um, you hear about that's going to happen, but that sort of brings home the Alzheimer's. That brings home what's happening. And so I, I was really heartbroken. And then over the years, he has forgotten who I am. But what I love and look back on now is the name is not really so important. It's the eye contact that I still have with him and the smile that brings recognition almost to tell me he feels safe mm. if I'm there. And that's really what I am now is a, a protector for him. It, you, you sort of shift roles when you become a caregiver. And I didn't know this. I've just experienced it. Um, but it, the name, I, I was shocked for a while. It hurt mm -hmm. for a long time. But now I, I don't, it doesn't matter because I know in his heart he feels okay and safe. Wow, it's really powerful. There's a word that we use a lot at the Alzheimer's Society called anasygnosia. And anasygnosia is a term referred to when somebody does not recognize their symptom, is not able to see the symptoms of their diagnosis. And there is a moment in the book where you, you know, you, you touch on this part. And I know a lot of family members will express to me that my, my partner doesn't get it. They, they need to understand and understand their diagnosis. They're not getting it. What is something you want to tell those caregivers who may struggle to see this anasygnosia piece? It's tough. Um, there's a line between denial and not knowing. And my love doesn't know. And the, I don't know that it matters. I, I think that um, I wouldn't want to, if, I don't know, I can't react how it would be if he knew. So I don't have that experience. But I'm, I'm not sure that I would want to make a big deal about his knowing or not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, I just have not had the experience to say, oh, will you forget? I don't bring it up because it doesn't matter because he doesn't know. Yeah. And um, that would only cause friction and I don't want that. So yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I try and keep a, a low key, everything I go for low key, I try to keep a level emotional, uh, emotional level in our life um, mm -hmm. because it keeps the stress down. Yes. And you do, you're very honest in your book, which I think a lot of caregivers are going to appreciate because you do talk about how your love sometimes expresses himself in a way that could be seen as hostile or aggressive as people say. And there's a moment where it's really smart of you. You wait till everything is relaxed and balanced as you're referring to. And I'm going to read a quote that you, you take from him. You asked him why he was being hostile in the moment. And he says, you just don't realize you never will know how horrible it is to have these disease, have these diseases, pardon me. Many people describe persons with dementia as aggressive or angry in certain situations when that sometimes really isn't the case. And with your experience, what is something you've learned about your love and how he expresses himself that some people may perceive as aggressive? Well, we do have to take a new perspective on life. I think when you become a caregiver, that what in the norm, no, normal, and I say that in quotes because I'm not sure there is a normal, I have learned that. Mm -hmm. um, ag aggression, I have think, comes from fear. Now, it may not be fear right there in the moment, but maybe even internal fear. Mm -hmm. And that's a little, something I'm surmising, but it appears to me that um, they may become aggressive. And my job is to distract or to um, redirect where our thoughts are, what our discussion is. And in these days, in the later stages, it may be easier than earlier stages because I can come up with a new topic and 
it is a distraction where years ago it might have been a little more difficult to do that but it's still the same intention um because they're feeling trapped i think they're feeling and the fear and the pain that it, in my love's case, he had um, elevated calcium as well for a year, over a year. And the pain in his body, it was just heartbreaking to watch it. And mm -hmm. I think if it had been me, I don't know if I would act acted any different. You get mad because you hurt. You get mad yeah. because you're in it, pain. You're in pain, right. It wasn't so much that he couldn't remember things. It was the pain, I think, that was anguish for him. And everybody's different. I have to. I have to say that every caregiver will have a different experience. What we all share is the emotion of realizations, the emotion of um, compassion and empathy. I think it develops in us. I'm not sure we all come to this job with that, and I call it a job because it has become one. But we get. We learn. We learn as we go along. There's a piece in the book that I think would resonate with many caregivers, which is the obsession of understanding why. Why am I in this situation? Why did my husband, wife, mom, dad get this diagnosis? And really, you talk about how you were also obsessed with trying to find these answers of why. What have you learned? How, what are ways you've learned to get around these obsessions of trying to find answers that most likely can't be found? Well, that's what I have found. You can't, there is no answer. Um, and actually, the, the, you look and you read the thousands of sites that are out there of studies being done. There's a lot of research going on. There's just no answer yet. There's just no, we're just not there yet. And, um, the thing that kind of held held me or grounded me, I guess, was reading the research, mm -hmm. understanding um, edu at the education level, even even the caregiver level. But it wasn't just about the disease; it was also about the caregiver because you do need to understand the disease somewhat. Yeah. But more than that, I had to understand the the caring part. The and I had to look up what's caring. What does a caregiver do? I mean, I don't, I don't do the things a PSW caregiver does all the time. But you get a sense of, oh, this is the person I'm becoming. I'm becoming somebody different. And yeah. it's okay because I'm, I kind of like this somebody. Now, I don't know that everybody does. I know that there are some people find it much harder to do this. Um, God bless you all who are doing this because I got to tell you, I don't think there's anything harder. Um, but I didn't know that when I started, not that I could have made a different choice, but <laughs> we, we don't know. Definitely. And I, I admire so much about your positivity, Judy. And, and one thing I know and I do admire also about you is how you find the importance in self care for caregiving. And I think that's one of the hardest things for caregivers to do, as you said, is providing time for yourself or, so what are some of the tools and avenues you've used to provide yourself with self-care as a caregiver? Well, I was, caregiver. I, I was one of those who didn't realize that importance in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness for the coffee group that I belong to. It was a support group we met every week. Wonderful idea if you if you're a caregiver, find a lifeline. Um, but I, 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 ju I just, I, I, need, I needed connection. I needed people to tell me, um, recognize in me that I was in trouble. And then say, um, why don't you? And what they told me was, don't forget who you are. Don't forget you love to write don't forget that you love music don't forget that you were an art teacher and you still love art don't forget don't let that go mm -hmm. and um actually i've brought it into my caregiving as opposed to just for me i do these things now with my loved one we do music together we do art together and he doesn't write but i read to him 
and um, and sometimes he can still remember the the connection or the theme. But I've kept those in my life by using them in my caregiving. Wow. So it was double, double, uh, double good that they told me that. <laughs> I know you always have a passion for, for learning and education as well, and you've spoken to that already, but I know between each other, you've mentioned the importance of taking a break, which we know in 2020 for caregivers was near to impossible, but when things hopefully get provided again, such as day programs, or um, I know even during COVID, the importance of having care within your home, at the Alzheimer's Society, we are told by many caregivers that my mom will not let care into the home. This, it didn't work and it never will work. And there's of course a lot of frustrations in these moments. I know you've had an interesting journey of allowing care within your home for your partner. And you know the journey you've had with the transition of going to a day program when those were open. Could you share a little bit about how it is a journey and that it's not just an easy happens seamlessly type of situation? Yes. And the COVID period is a little bit different. So let's yeah. say that's not going to last all the time. Yes. Um, okay. um, so my experience was before the COVID. And um, when I finally was told that I would have PSWs, I wasn't prepared. And um, I'm not sure how to prepare yourself, but uh, look into it a little bit, ask those who know, and maybe even ask the people who are going to send you um, the PSW, ask them how it should be. I was told, oh, you have to leave. So I had them come in and I'd say goodbye. And there was my loved one with a, somebody he didn't know and it was traumatic mm -hmm. and he called me where I was and had me come home and that didn't work of course but and I didn't understand that I needed to take some time and be with the person that was going to be in our home with my loved one I had to be with them maybe two or three times um, First, yeah. We went through five people, different, different. One was a, a lady who loved to walk with him. She was wonderful. Actually, she retired after we found her. And then um, we, we had some who, who came to help him in the shower. And we had one who could shave. Um, but they didn't work because I left and I didn't understand. And finally, the sweet girl that does the scheduling said to me, why don't you just stay? And um, I thought, oh, okay, that's an option. And so the next one they sent to me happened to be a wonderful conversationalist. And I just loved to talk to her. And she was there for over a year before the um, COVID. Mm -hmm. But I stayed home or did laundry. And I didn't feel I had to leave all the time. And during that period, my loved one and our PSW became closer. It did mm. take six months. It still took yeah. six months twice a week. Yeah. So my expectation in the beginning was I'm going to get to go out. Yeah. But I didn't. And that really was wrong. And so there was a time hard on my loved one that didn't need to be because of my not understanding. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened when he went into the daycare um, day program. Day program, excuse me, day program. And um, wonderful people there. And I didn't really have an idea of what to tell him. Um, and he was only going for an hour and a half at first. But that was still too long. And um, I'd get phone calls. He's waiting in the parking lot for you. Can you come now? That took four months for him to be able to get out four of the Four months. Car four months to be able to get out of the car and go in and really tell me you don't need to come with me I know what I'm doing so it was it was a wonderful day when I could call my Alzheimer's counselor and say you're not going to believe what just happened and, um, but I think we know we hear the stories other people tell we don't hear the beginning always we hear the middle yes. or we hear the success end. and not the 
and mm -hmm. and not the part where they had to be patient for it to to come to fruition and i i think that's really the important part um for for everybody not to feel that you did something wrong if it doesn't work you know i was almost ready to say i don't want anybody because it's not working mm -hmm. until this sweet girl who did the scheduling suggested something scheduler telling yeah. me because she was talking to caregivers all the time and you just have mm -hmm. to remember there are a lot of people out there that are going to help you caregivers who are watching this nobody knows you need help if you don't reach out nobody knows that you're sitting there alone in agony in desperation because i know you are because i was mm -hmm. and you have to be brave pick up the phone takes one phone call and then you have a connection call the alzheimer's society call the library and ask them who they would suggest but don't sit home alone that's that's really my biggest message to caregivers is just mm -hmm. don't do this alone well that actually leads to my, the last question i have for you which is what advice would you give to to a, a new caregiver who just got a diagnosis for their their parent or their friend or their partner what's the what's something that they could do um well first you ask what they need i would think mm -hmm. it, it you we have no idea what the other person is going through that's really tough yeah. and um let them talk to you let them first of all that may be good all they may need is just to talk about it but rather than you telling them your story let them tell you their story um you are a good connection for them to begin with and you may all you may do is say call the alzheimer's you may give them a phone number all you you may just give them the phone number for lynn you just the um provincial health care uh, Local Health Organized. Integration Network. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you, it just, you may just be somebody who, you're just a connection, that's all. But that's helpful. That's yeah. helpful. That's somebody then who's not alone. Yeah. And you Listen. can't tell them don't be alone because that may be their choice. But their life is going to be so much easier and the burden so much lighter if they can have somebody else connected with them along their journey. And definitely at the Alzheimer's Society, for anyone out there, we are all across Canada and we're here to help. And we are a free service with one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as free education offered currently online and hopefully when it's safe to do so in person too. So um, we're also reaching that, that handout for you if you, you need help. So I did wanna end our conversation with the end of your book, because we started with the beginning. I wanted to, um, quote Judy's words that is for all of you caregivers out there. Never doubt the power of your love. Remember you are fulfilling a vital service. Your empathy, compassion, patience, kindness, and flexibility will help lighten your burdens as you listen, navigate, communicate, advocate, coordinate, and care for your loved ones. You are an awesome caregiver and doing the best you can at any moment. Thank you so much, Judy, for joining us and inspiring I'm me and, and all others too. I'm glad I encourage caregivers and, and um, congratulations on January Alzheimer's Awareness. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope lots of people learn lots of things. Thank you so much. And thank you, Halton Hills Library, for hosting us. Yeah. Thank you. It's been our pleasure. And uh, just to conclude, thank you, Judy, so much for joining us today to share your caregiving story and Danielle for moderating the discussion. It's been our pleasure. And if you are interested in learning more, please do uh, contact your local library. Thank you.